There's a difference between the way absorption is measured in a clear medium and in a turbid medium. And the differences in those two things are encapsulated in what's called the modified Beer-Lambert law. So let's start with the standard Beer-Lambert law. So I'll write Beer-Lambert law. And what that pertains to is a situation where you have no turbidity. And in that situation, you have a source. And the source is a directed beam. It goes through a material that has a certain length. We'll call that length L. So that's the path length. Light propagates through that medium like this, comes out the other end, and goes to a detector. And if that medium in here is characterized by some absorption coefficient mu a, we would say that the signal or the intensity at the detector is equal to the intensity of the beam coming from the source. And then there's an exponential decay, e to the minus mu a times that length l. So that's the standard Beer-Lambert law, where there's this exponential dependence upon path length and upon the absorption coefficient. Now we're going to modify that. Here's the modified Beer-Lambert law, MBLL. And to start thinking about that, we consider a material that has air up here, and we've got tissue down below. And what we're going to do is we're going to inject light into this material here, and we're going to measure light coming out of the material here. We're going to give that a separation var variable called rho. So the light that goes from source to detector is going to travel along some ensemble of paths conceptually sketched here. I'm going to show you a video. So what we have here is a movie. It animates exactly the situation we just talked about, where light is going to come in up here, in, injected into this tissue region, and light is going to come out here a few millimeters away. So let's run the movie. And you can see that for the first couple of picoseconds, nothing happens. But after about 20 picoseconds, we start to see red encoded individual paths. This is a simulation of photon propagation, and it's showing that at 30 picoseconds, there are many photons that have entered this medium have traveled along some various path and have reached the exit location over here. Other photons, of course, go in at this location and never get out to this detection point. We're looking at a subset of the photon paths, namely those that actually not only came in here, but also went out here. Let's run the movie along and just see it once going through, and then we'll talk about the various time points. So watch the time advancing along. You can see these distributions getting wilder and farther apart and also getting less dense over time. There's much less light at 115 picoseconds arriving at the detector than there was earlier on. We'll let this run all the way out and then we'll go back to the beginning. Okay, so at 5 picoseconds no light has had a chance to even reach the detector yet. Our earliest time point is here at 20 picoseconds and we see a very shallow Path. There are not as many photons arriving at 20 picoseconds as there are at 25 or 30 picoseconds. This is around the maximum for this source detector separation. And this path that you see here, we often in biomedical optics call this the banana. Uh, this is the volume of most explored space if you average out all of the photons that arrive at the detector without discriminating for time. You'll see this banana continue to persist for the next couple of time steps. Here we are at 40 picoseconds. So again, this sort of shape is what we call the banana. And this is still in the regime of the most dominantly explored space, the most common photon paths that get you from the source to the detector, although you're starting to see some paths include some considerable departures. So we'll just run it out again. And notice that now at 70 or 80 picoseconds, there isn't as much light reaching this detector anymore. So these paths as an ensemble are less probable than the ones earlier because the earlier ensemble had more paths in it. So more light travels for about 40 or 50 picoseconds before getting to the detector as opposed to light that travels for 70 or 80 picoseconds. And by the time you get out here to over 100 picoseconds, many fewer paths are 
connecting the source to the detector. Okay. How would we write the detected light up here as a function of the source light coming in here? Well, we're not going to write it exactly the way we did before, but we can try to write it in a similar way. So we might say that the detected light that we see, it's certainly going to be proportional to the strength of the source light. And then instead of having just a single path length L that all of the photons took to get through the material, here to get through the tissue from the source location to the detector location, we have to sum over a whole bunch of different distances that the photons might travel. So we had these different path lengths, Li, corresponding to the different times of arrival. Those were all equal path lengths for a given time of arrival. And then we have to say, well, there was some probability of the photon traveling for, uh, for reaching the detector and traveling for that length. As we saw, that probability was higher at certain times than it was at other times because there were more paths available to it due to the nature of the scattering and the separation. That probability, it's going to depend upon the scattering. I'm going to write reduced scattering here. And also rho, the source detector separation, also helps to dictate what that probability is for different path lengths L sub i. Not being shown in the video was the fact that the different path lengths are also affected by absorption. And each different path length has a different amount of attenuation. So now we can start making a bunch of approximations to, ret to make this summation look like a single term here. So I'll write that this is approximately equal to the following. Well, we're going to keep the proportionality all the way throughout to the source strength. And then in, there's a sum over a whole bunch of paths with different exponential decays. Now we're going to make a leap and say that th this sum can be approximated as being one big global coefficient g, which is again a function of the scattering properties of the tissue and the source detector separation, and then no longer a sum, but just a single e to the minus mu a average path length. So this is definitely an approximation. It's not a rigorous summation of anything. We haven't given any functional form for this p here, but we're asserting that we can roughly say that there's an overall tissue and geometry factor and an overall average path length factor. So I'll label that as the average path length. Average path length dictated by mu s prime n rho multiplied by mu a to give our exponential decay factor. Now we keep going. We're going to make another approximation. We're going to keep i. We're going to keep g, but we're going to say that this average value of the path length traveled is approximately able to be written by a quantity we call the differential path length factor. I'll write that out here. Differential path length factor, and then multiplied by the source detector separation. Now this kind of makes sense that the average length scale of the path length would probably get longer the farther apart the source de and detector are. So that's what we're asserting here, is that if I know how far apart the source and detector are, I can multiply that by a correction coefficient to estimate how long the path length was inside the medium that the photon actually traveled. It certainly doesn't travel a, direct, a distance rho. It's going to travel a multiple of rho greater than one in the tissue, and that's called the differential path length factor. So let me emphasize the differential path length factor is is greater than one. All right, we're not done yet. We're going to make uh, another approximation, and that's that the differential path length factor is independent of mu a which is to say that if I change the amount of absorption in the tissue, we know from discussions in class that the average path length that the photons arriving at this detector will travel will shrink because the longer path lengths get punished more by absorption. However, we're going to make the approximation that if we're not varying UA too much, then it's approximately true that 
the average path length doesn't change too much, and therefore this correction factor DPF doesn't change too much. And if that's true, we can then imagine that we have some mu a which is varying in time, like if you had a heartbeat, for instance. So mu a as a function of time is an initial mu a zero value plus a change in mu a, which is a function of time. So let's write this expression out one more time. We've got the detected signal as a function of time equaling that same is, that same g, and then it's equal to e to the minus mu a zero dpf times rho times e to the minus delta mu a of t times the dpf times rho. Now what's interesting about this is that all of this stuff is a constant not changing with time. I can bundle all of this into a global constant and think about the ratio of the signal at the detector at an arbitrary time t versus the signal that arrived at the detector at the start of the experiment, say, at time t equals zero. Well, if you look at all this stuff, and if I set delta mu a of t to, to zero, by definition, delta mu a hasn't changed from its initial value when t equals zero. So I can write all of this stuff as the denominator down here, and then the only thing left over ratioing the signal at a later time to its initial time is this time varying term over here. So I get e to the minus delta mu a of t times this dpf factor times rho. So this is now pretty powerful because the dpf is known. How we get a value of dpf, an actual quantitative value, has to be discussed later, but the point is that you can commit to that value ahead of time using simulations or measurements or first principles calculations, and, it, and henceforth, you know this value going in. Certainly something that we know in an actual experiment is the source detector separation, so that's known. The only thing left that's not known is for each time measurement, we have an associated delta mu a, how mu a is changing with time. We, have, we now have the information that allows us to solve for delta mu a of t. And delta mu a of t is something we're interested in. It could be the variation in the amount of blood in a region of tissue due to the, due to the pulsations of your heart or, or due to the activity of your brain. So this allows us to, to monitor changes in, for instance, blood oxygenation or concentration. We'll discuss the limitations of this model in class just to emphasize that it only detects relative changes in blood concentration. The modified Beer-Lambert law is not sensitive to absolute amounts of blood, but it does do a good job of detecting temporal changes. So this equation over here is what is called the modified Beer-Lambert law.